Hey everyone, how goes it? Welcome back to Computer Science 311. Today, we're going to discuss deadlocks. In a multi-programming environment, several threads may compete for a finite number of resources. Sometimes, a waiting thread can never again change the state because the resource it has requested are being held by other waiting threads. This situation is called a deadlock. Let's consider this system model. A system consists of a finite number of resources to be distributed among a number of competing threads. The resources may be partitioned into several types or classes, each consisting of some number of identical instances. For instance, these could be CPU cycles, files, and I.O. devices. If a system has four CPUs, then the resource type CPU then has four instances. Similarly, the resource type network may have two instances. If a thread requests an instance of a resource type, the allocation of any instance of this type should satisfy the request. If it does not, then the instances are not identical and the resource type classes have not been defined properly. The synchronization tools that were discussed in a previous lecture, such as mutex locks and semaphores, are also system resources. And on contemporary computer systems, they are the most common sources of a deadlock. Under the normal mode of operation, a thread may utilize a resource in only the following sequence. First, request. The thread requests the resource. If the request cannot be granted immediately, then the requesting thread must wait until it can acquire the resource. 2. Use The thread can operate on the resource. For example, if the resource is a mutex lock, the thread can access its critical section. And finally, release. The thread releases the resource. Here's an example of a deadlock with semaphores. Let's say, for instance, semaphore S1 was initialized to the value of 1, and semaphore S2 was initialized also to the value of 1. Looking at these two processes, if we were going to wait on this S1, this decrements this by 1. And since it is equal to 0 at this point, we're still OK. Simultaneously, process 2 waits on semaphore 2, which decrements its value to also being 0. We're still OK here, but look at the next statements. If process P1 waits on semaphore 2, which is currently at value 0, it becomes negative 1. This means process P1 will have to block. Simultaneously, process P2 waits on semaphore S1, which was also the value of 0 now, and now it becomes negative 1. This means process P2 blocks. Both of these processes are blocking because it's waiting on a resource, a semaphore that the other one is also waiting for. A deadlock situation can arise if the following four conditions hold simultaneously in a system. First, mutual exclusion. At least one resource must be held in a non-shareable mode. That is, only one thread at a time can use the resource. If another thread requests that resource, the requesting thread must be delayed until the resource has been released. Hold and wait. A thread must be holding at least one resource and waiting to acquire an additional resource that is currently being held by another thread. No preemption. Resources cannot be preempted that is, a resource can be released only voluntarily by the thread holding it after the thread has completed its task. And finally, circular weight. Let's suppose that there exists a set of threads, or in this case processes, piece of zero to piece of n. Now let's further suppose that piece of zero is waiting for the resource held by piece of one. 
P sub 1 is waiting for the resource that is held by P sub 2, then P sub 3, 4, all the way to P sub n minus 1. Finally, P sub n is waiting on the resource that was initially held by P sub 0. Now we emphasize that all four conditions must hold for a deadlock to occur. Deadlocks can be described more precisely in terms of a directed graph called a system resource allocation graph. This graph consists of a set of vertices V and a set of edges E. The set of vertices V is partitioned into two different types of nodes. For argument's sake, we're going to interchange process and task a good bit. Now let's suppose that P is the set consisting of all of the active processes in a system, and R is the set consisting of all resource types in the system. We also denote that there are N processes and M resources. A directed edge from the process P sub I to the resource R sub I is denoted by the forward edge. This signifies that the process P sub I has requested an instance of the resource type R sub J and is currently waiting for that resource. Now conversely, a directed edge from the resource type R sub J to a process P sub I is denoted by the forward edge R sub J to P sub I. This signifies that an instance of a resource type R sub J has been allocated to the process P sub I. Now the directed edge going from a process to a resource is called a request edge. A directed edge going from a resource to a process is called the assignment edge. Pictorially, we represent the process P sub I as a circle and its resource type R sub J as a rectangle. Now up until this point, we have been referring to the processes as a set called P. Now they have distinguished this as the set of threads called T. So pretty much you can consider the T's as just being the P's. Now the resource allocation graph that's shown here depicts the following situations. You have, first of all, three sets. T, which corresponds to T sub 1 to 3. R, which corresponds to the resources R sub 1 to 4. And the edges, where T sub 1 maps to R sub 1, T sub 2 maps to R sub 3. R sub 1 maps to T sub 2, R sub 2, etc., etc., etc. Now going a little further with this, notice inside the rectangles for the resources you have these dots. These represent instances of those resources. So for instance, resource R sub 1 only has one resource type. R sub 2 on the other hand has two resource types. Resource R3 also only has one instance, and there are three instances of resource R4. Now understanding the difference between the request and the assignment edge, we can say that T sub 1 is holding an instance of a resource R sub 2 and is waiting for an instance of type R sub 1. Thread T2 is holding an instance of R sub 1 and an instance of R sub 2 is waiting for an instance R sub 3. And finally, thread T sub 3 is holding an instance of R sub 3. So once again, these correspond to the requests, these correspond to the assignments. Now given the definition of a resource allocation graph, it can be shown that if the graph contains no cycles, then no thread in the system is deadlocked. Now if the graph does contain a cycle, then a deadlock may exist. Now if each resource type had exactly one instance, then a cycle directly implies that there is a deadlock. Each thread involved in the cycle is deadlocked. In this case, a cycle in the graph is both necessary and sufficient condition for the deadlock to exist. However, if each resource type had several instances, then a cycle does not necessarily imply that a deadlock has occurred. In this case, a cycle in the graph is necessary but not sufficient condition for the existence of a deadlock. Now to illustrate this, let's take this following resource allocation graph. 
So assuming that this thread T sub three requests an instance of the resource type R sub two. Now, since no resource instances is currently available, we add the request edge going from T sub three to R sub two to the graph. At this point, two minimal cycles exist in the system. T1 to R1, T2 to R3, T3 to R2, R2 to T1. And also, T2 to R3, R3 to T3, R2 to T2. The threads T1, T2, and T3 are deadlocked. Thread T2 is waiting for the resource R3, which is held currently by thread T3. T3 is waiting for either T1 or T2 thread to release a resource in R2. In addition, thread T1 is waiting for thread T2 to release the resource R1. Let's consider this example. Obviously, by the title, there is no deadlock, but why? We can observe that there exists a cycle, T1 to R1, R1 to T3, R2 to T1. However, even with the cycle, there is no deadlock. Observe that T4 may release its instance of resource R2. That resource can then be allocated to T3, thus breaking the cycle. In summary, if a resource allocation graph does not have a cycle, then the system is not in a deadlock state. However, if there is a cycle, then the system may or may not be in a deadlocked state. Now this observation is very important when we deal with the deadlock problem. Generally speaking, we can deal with the deadlock problem in one of three ways. First, we can ignore the problem altogether and pretend that deadlocks never occur in the system. Alternatively, we can use a protocol to prevent or avoid deadlocks, ensuring that the system will never enter a deadlock state. Or we can allow the system to enter the deadlock state, detect it, and then recover. The first solution is the one used by most operating systems, and this includes Linux and Windows. It is then up to the kernel and the application developers to write programs that handle deadlocks, typically using approaches outlined in the second solution. Some systems, such as databases, adopt the third solution, allowing deadlocks to occur and then managing the recovery. To ensure that deadlocks never occur, the system can either use a deadlock prevention or deadlock avoidance scheme. In deadlock prevention, this provides a set of methods to ensure that at least one of the necessary conditions cannot hold. These methods prevent deadlocks by constraining how the requests for the resources are made. Now, alternatively, deadlock avoidance requires that the operating system be given additional information in advance concerning which resources a thread will request and use during its lifetime. With this additional knowledge, the operating system can decide for each request whether or not the thread should wait. To decide whether or not the current request can be satisfied or delayed, the system must consider the resources currently available, the resources currently allocated to each thread, and the future requests and releases of each thread. Now we're going to ignore the strategy where we ignore deadlocks. We're now going to focus on deadlock prevention and deadlock detection. Now, for deadlock prevention, we need to examine the four necessary conditions separately. First, mutual exclusion. The mutual exclusion condition must hold. That is, at least one resource must be non-shareable. Shareable resources do not require mutual exclusive access and thus cannot be involved in the deadlock. Read-only files are a good example of a shareable resource. If several threads attempt to open a read-only file at the same time, they can be granted simultaneously access to the file. A thread never needs to wait for a shareable resource. In general, however, we cannot prevent deadlocks by denying the mutual exclusion condition because some resources are intrinsically non-shareable. For example, a mutex lock cannot be simultaneously shared by several threads. 
Now let's look at hold and wait. To ensure that the hold and wait condition never occurs in the system, we must guarantee that whenever a thread requests a resource, it does not hold any other resource. One protocol that we can use requires that each thread to request and be allocated all of its resource before it begins execution. This of course is impractical for most applications due to the dynamic nature of requesting resources. Now an alternative protocol allows a thread to request a resource only when it has none. A thread may request some resource and then use them. Before it can request any additional resources, it must release all the resources that it is currently allocated. Both of these protocols have two major disadvantages. First, resource utilization may be low, since resources may be allocated but unused for a long period of time. For example, a thread may be allocated a mutex lock for its entire execution, yet only require it for a very short duration. Second, starvation is possible. A thread that needs several popular resources may have to wait indefinitely because at least one of the resources that it needs is always allocated to some other thread. Let's take a look at the next condition, no preemption. The third necessary condition for deadlocks is there is no preemption of the resources that have been allocated. To ensure that this condition does not hold, we can use the following protocol. If a thread is holding some resource and requests another resource that cannot be immediately allocated to it, then all resources the thread is currently holding are preempted. In other words, these resources are implicitly released. The preempted resources are then added to the list of resources for which the threads are waiting. The thread will be restarted only when it can regain its old resources, as well as the new ones that it is requesting. Now an alternative protocol is if the thread requests some resources, we first check whether they are available. If they are, we allocate them. If they are not, we check whether they are allocated to some other thread that is waiting for additional resources. If so, we preempt the desired resource from the waiting thread and allocate them to the requesting thread. If the resource are neither available nor held by a waiting thread, the requesting thread must wait. While it is waiting, some of its resources may be preempted, but only if another thread requests them. A thread can only be restarted when it is allocated the new resource that it's requesting and recovers any resources that were preempted while it was waiting. Now this protocol is often applied to resources whose state can be easily saved and restored later, such as CPU registers and database transactions. It cannot generally be applied to such resources such as mutex locks and semaphores. And remember, this is where most deadlocks occur. Finally, we have a circular wait. The three options presented so far for the deadlock preventions are generally impractical in most situations. However, this and final condition for a deadlock presents an opportunity for a practical solution by invalidating one of the necessary conditions. One way to ensure that this condition never holds is to impose a total ordering of all resource types and require that each thread requests a resource in an increasing order of enumeration. Now to illustrate this, let's suppose that we had a set of resources R sub 1 to R sub M. We assign each resource type to a unique integer value. Now we compare two resources and determine whether one precedes another in our ordering. Now we can accomplish this scheme in an application program by developing an ordering among all synchronization objects in the system. Now we can accomplish this scheme in an application program by developing an ordering among all synchronization objects in the system. For an example, the lock ordering in this pthread program that we see to the side here could be first we assign the first mutex to 1 and the second mutex to 5. We can now consider the following protocol to prevent deadlocks.
Each thread can request resources only in an increasing order of enumeration. That is, a thread can initially request an instance of a resource, let's say some R sub i. After that, the thread can request an instance of another resource, R sub j, if and only if R sub j's priority is greater than R sub i's priority. For example, a thread that wants to use both the first mutex and second mutex as we see here at the same time must first request the first mutex and then later request the second mutex. Alternatively, we can require that a thread requesting an instance of a resource R sub j must have released any resources R sub i such that that R sub i is greater than or equal to R sub j. Note also that if several instances of the same resource type are needed, a single request for all of them must be issued. Now keep in mind that developing an ordering or a hierarchy does not in itself prevent the deadlock. It is up to the application developer to write programs that follow this ordering. However, establishing a lock ordering can be very difficult, especially on systems with hundreds or thousands of locks. Once again, it is important to note that imposing a lock ordering does not guarantee deadlock prevention if the locks can be acquired dynamically. Now we have previously discussed the deadlock prevention algorithms. Now let's take a look at deadlock avoidance. Now, an alternative method for avoiding deadlocks is to require additional information about how resources are requested. The various algorithms that use this approach differ in the amount and type of information required. The simplest and most useful model requires that each thread declare the maximum number of resources of each type that it may need. Given this is priority information, it is possible to construct an algorithm that ensures that the system will never enter a deadlock state. A deadlock avoidance algorithm dynamically examines the resource allocation state to ensure that the circular weight condition can never exist. The resource allocation state is defined by the number of available and allocated resources and the maximum demands of the threads. Now we're going to explore two deadlock avoidance algorithms. Before we get to that, we have to establish what is a safe state. We consider a state is safe if the system can allocate resources to each thread in some order and it still avoid a deadlock. More formally, a system is in a safe state only if there exists a safe sequence. A sequence of threads is a safe sequence for the current allocation state if, for each T sub i, the resource request that T sub i can still make can be satisfied by the currently available resources plus the resources held by all T sub j with j being less than i. In this situation, if the resources that T sub i needs are not immediately available, then T sub i can wait until T sub j has finished. When they have finished, T sub i can obtain all of its needed resources, complete its design task, and return its allocated resources. Whenever T sub i terminates, T sub i plus 1 can now obtain its necessary resource, and so on. Now, if no such sequence exists, then the system is in an unsafe state. A safe state is not a deadlocked state, and conversely, a deadlocked state is in an unsafe state. Not all unsafe states are deadlocks. However, an unsafe state may lead to a deadlock. Now, as long as the state is safe, the operating system can avoid unsafe and deadlocked states. In an unsafe state, the operating system cannot prevent threads from requesting resources in such a way that a deadlock occurs. The behavior of the thread controls its unsafe states. Now we can see this illustration here. If you're in a safe state, there's no possible way to have a deadlock. However, if you're in an unsafe state, there may exist a deadlock, but not necessarily. Now, given the concept of a safe state, we can define avoidance algorithms that ensure that the system will never deadlock. 
The idea is to simply ensure that the system will always remain in a safe state. Initially, the system is in a safe state. Whenever a thread requests a resource that is currently available, the system must decide whether the resource can be allocated immediately or the thread must wait. The thread is granted only if the allocation leaves the system in a safe state. If we have a resource allocation system with only one instance of each resource type, we can use a variant of the resource allocation graph defined in a previous slide. Now, in addition to the request and assignment edges already described, we introduce a new type of edge called a claim edge. Now, a claim edge is defined as an edge pointing from a T sub I to an R sub J, which indicates that the thread may request the resource R sub J at some point in the future. This edge resembles a request edge in the direction, but it is represented in the graph by a dashed line. Now, when a thread T sub I requests a resource R sub J, the claim edge is converted into a request edge. Similarly, when a resource R sub J is released by a T sub I, the assignment edge is then reconverted to a claim edge. Note that resources must be claimed a priori in the system. That is, before a thread T sub I starts executing, all of its claimed edges must already appear in the resource allocation graph. Now we can relax this condition by allowing a claim edge going from T sub I to an R sub J to be added. To further illustrate this algorithm, let's consider the resource allocation graph here. Now suppose a T sub 2 requests an R sub 2. Although R sub 2 is currently free, we cannot allocate it to the T sub 2 since this action will create a cycle in the graph. Now a cycle mentioned indicates that the system is in an unsafe state. If T sub 1 requests an R sub 2 and T sub 2 requests an R sub 1, then a deadlock will absolutely occur. The resource allocation graph algorithm is not applicable to resource allocation systems with multiple instances of a resource type. Now the next deadlock avoidance algorithm that we're going to describe is applicable to such systems, but is less efficient than a resource allocation graph scheme. This algorithm is commonly known as the banker's algorithm. Whenever a new thread enters the system, it must declare the maximum number of instances of each resource type that it may need. This number may not exceed the total number of resources in the system. When a user requests a set of resources, the system must determine whether the allocation of these resources will leave the system in a safe state. If it will, the resources are allocated, but otherwise the thread must wait until some other thread releases its other resources. Several data structures must be maintained in order to implement the banker's algorithm. These data structures encode the state of the resource allocation system. We need the following data structures where n is the number of threads in the system and m is the number of resource types. First, we define the structure available. This is a vector of length m, indicating the number of available resources of each type. If available at index j equals a k, then k instances of a resource type r sub j are available. Next, the data structure max. This is an n by m matrix defines the maximum demands of each thread. If a max i and j equals a k, then the thread t sub i may request at most k instances of the resource type r sub j. Next, the data structure allocation. This is another n by m matrix that defines the number of resources of each type currently allocated to each thread. If allocation i sub j equals a k, then the thread t sub i is currently allocated k instances of the resource type r sub j. And finally, the data structure need. 
This again is an N by M matrix that indicates the remaining resources needs of each thread. If need IJ is equal to K, that means thread T sub I may need K more resources of that resource type R sub J to complete its task. Note that need I and J must equal max I and J minus allocation I and J. Now given all those data structures, we now present the safety algorithm. This algorithm is described as follows. First, let work and finish be vectors of length M and N respectively. Initialize the vector work equal to available and finish set all of its values to false for some i to n minus 1. Next, find an index i such that both finish is false and the need is less than or equal to work. If no such i exists, then go to step 4. Next, work is equal to work plus allocation, and we assign finish is equal to true. Once we do that, we can loop back to step two. If all of the vector finish are assigned to true in the system, then we can safely say that the system is in a safe state. Now, this algorithm may require an order of n by n squared operations to determine whether or not the state is safe. Now we're going to describe an algorithm to determine whether requests can be safely granted. Let request sub i be the request vector of a thread t sub i. If request sub i at index j is equal to a k, then thread t sub i wants k instances of the resource r sub j. When a request for the resource is made by t sub i, the following actions are then taken. First, if the request is less than or equal to the need, then we go on to step two. Otherwise, there's an error since the thread has exceeded the maximum claim. Step two, if request is less than or equal to available, then we go to step three. Otherwise, T sub I must wait since the resources are just not available. Finally, we have the system pretend to have allocated the requested resources in the thread T sub i by modifying the states as follows. We assign available equal to available minus that request. We reset allocation sub i is equal to allocation sub i plus the request sub i. Finally, we update need sub i as equal to need sub i minus the request. If the resulting resource allocation state is safe, the transaction is completed and the thread T sub i is allocated its resources. However, if the new state is unsafe, then T sub i must wait for request sub i and the old resource allocation state is then restored. To illustrate the banker's algorithm, let's consider a system with five threads, T sub zero to T sub four, or in this case in the slides, process is p sub zero to process p sub four. We also consider three resource types, A, B, and C. Resource type A has 10 instances. Resource type B has five. And resource type C has seven instances. Now suppose that the following snapshot represents the current state of the system. As you can see here, here are the data structures we were referring to. Allocation is an n by m data structure. Max is a separate data structure that is also n by m. And available is just a vector of size m with each of the available resources left. Note that each of these are distinct. And also, available is not a matrix, but it is a vector. So given this, we now need to calculate the need matrix, which is defined as the max minus the allocation, and it goes as follows. When we subtract each element component-wise, we end up with this need matrix.
Now running this algorithm, we can confirm that the system is in a safe state since the sequence P1, P3, P4, P2, and P0 satisfies the safety criteria. Now how were we able to accomplish this? Let's just look at this one by one. We calculated this need matrix right here. Now what we need to do is examine what's available and what each process needs. Keep in mind this is a vector and this doesn't indicate that this is some piece of zero, this is just a vector on its own. Now, if we go through each process sequentially, we can see that process piece of zero needs seven of resource A, four of resource B, and three of resource C. However, we can't satisfy that request because all of these values are greater than what's available, so process zero needs to wait. Now look at process piece of one. We need one, two, and two. What do we have available? Well, all of these values are greater than or equal to what we need. So yes, we can grant this right here. Now, assuming that this was granted, what happens is this is finished. And so what we end up doing is deallocating the elements that were captured by process P1 back to our available. So in this case, we basically take this element right here and add it back to this available right here, which now becomes 5, 3, and 2. Going to the next process, this needs 6, 0, and 0. But as we currently have 5, 3, and 2, this cannot be granted. We need to move on. Process P3 only needs 0, 1, and 1, which is absolutely fine. What we're going to do is grant these resources that are needed. And once we've granted these resources, we assume that process P3, much like P1, completes. As this process has been completed, it deallocates the resources that it had. So now it adds two back to here, which is now seven, four, and three. Sequentially going down to the next process P4, all of these values are less than what's currently available. So we can grant that. Skipping to P sub zero, well, we still currently don't have enough to grant this request, so we need to move on to P sub two. We can easily grant this one, then we deallocate it, and then we go back to P sub zero, we can grant that one, and so we can safely say that this represents a safe sequence. Now, also with the safety algorithm, we introduce this request. Let's say that process P1 requests an additional resource of A, no more of B, and two additional resources of C. Now, if we assume that this is the request, here's what we had formally available. As you can see, each one of the components are less than or equal to the other components, so we can say that that is true. Now, if this wasn't true, then we cannot grant this request because we do not have enough available resources. But in this case, we do. So we take these values and subtract them component-wise from this vector, which now leaves this available vector right here. Now similarly, we have to alter the values of what we're allocating here and what we need here. If we once again follow the exact same steps as we had just seen, we can determine that the sequence P1, P3, P4, P0, and P2 satisfies the safety requirement. Now to test your knowledge of this algorithm, try the following requests. Can P4 be granted three additional resources of A, three additional resources of B, and none of C? Alternatively, can process P0 be granted no additional resources of A, two more of B, and no more of C? Now if a system does not employ either a deadlock prevention or a deadlock avoidance algorithm, then a deadlock situation may occur. In this environment, the system may provide an algorithm that examines the state of the system to determine whether a deadlock has occurred and an algorithm to recover from that deadlock. If all resources have only a single instance, then we can define a deadlock detection algorithm that uses a variant of the resource allocation graph called a wait for graph. We obtain this graph from the resource allocation graph by removing the resource nodes and collapsing the appropriate edges.
we can see this collapsing procedure here, where we have simply removed all of the resources and then collapsed them into the threads like this. This is the wait for graph. Now, as before, a deadlock exists in the system if and only if the wait for graph contains a cycle. Remember, this is single resources. To detect deadlocks, the system needs to maintain the wait for graph and periodically invoke an algorithm that searches for a cycle in the graph. An algorithm to detect a cycle in a graph requires big O of n squared operations, where n is the number of vertices in the graph. Just like some other examples, the wait for graph scheme is not applicable to a resource allocation system with multiple instances of resource types. Now we have to turn to a deadlock detection algorithm that is applicable in such a system. The algorithm employs several time varying data structures that are very similar to those used in the banker's algorithm. And you'll notice that this is very similar to the banker's algorithm. The first data structure is called available. This is a vector of length m, indicating the number of available resources of each type. Next, we have allocation. This is an n by m matrix that defines the number of resources of each type currently allocated to each thread. Next, request, an n by m matrix that indicates the current request of each thread. If request i and j equals some k, then thread t sub i is requesting k more instances of the resource type r sub j. Now that we understand that, let's go over this detection algorithm. First, let work and finish be vectors of length m and n, respectively. We initialize work as equal to the values found in the vector available. Now for some i from 0 to n minus 1, if the allocation of i is not equal to 0, then finish of i is equal to false, otherwise finish of i is equal to true. Next we need to find an index i such that both finish is not equal to false and the request of i is less than the work. If no such i exists, then go to step 4. Next, we assign work is equal to work plus allocation. Now, assuming that the request of i was less than or equal to the vector work, we then reassign work is equal to work plus allocation. Thus, we've deallocated those resources from process i. Similarly, we assign finish at i is equal to true because it has finished. Finally, in step four, if a finish of i is equal to false, for any of the i's, then the system is deadlocked, which means that process could not finish. Now, in order to run this algorithm, it requires a big O complexity of m by n squared. Now, to illustrate this algorithm, we consider a system with five threads, or in this case processes, p sub 0 to p sub 4. We once again consider three resource types, A, B, and C. Resource type A has seven instances, resource type B has two, and resource type C has six. The following that we see here is the snapshot representation of the current state of the system. Once again, to denote this, this is the matrix N by M where this corresponds to the resources that have been allocated to each individual process. Over here are the requests by each one of the process that's again a matrix that is n by m. Now over here is the available resources that we have. Now we're about to run this algorithm, but we do have to point out something. We do not calculate the matrix need for the detection algorithm. We simply run this based on the allocation, the request, and the available. Now running through this, does this snapshot indicate that the system is in a deadlock? Well, let's check. We're gonna start out with this process p sub zero. Now it is requesting 
no resources. What's available? No resources. So this request is less than or equal to every component inside of here, so we can grant this request. And thus, we're going to let this process complete, deallocate its resources, and now available comes 0, 1, and 0. Process P1 requires 2, 0, and 2. Well, we don't have that available, so we can't grant that request. We move on to process P2. It's requesting, well, nothing as well. So we can grant this request, and then we add the allocation back to our available. In this case, what we end up having is now 3, 1, and 3. Now next, P sub 3 only requests one instance of type A, which can be granted, we deallocate that, and we're good. Now, as we keep following this, we can determine that each one of these requests can be granted, and there is no deadlock. Now, enhancing this example, let's suppose that process P2 requests one additional instance of type C. So we update our table to look like this. Here's the one additional instance of type C. Now, if we follow this algorithm again, we have to confirm that it is in a deadlock scenario. Now, yes, we can reclaim resources that are held still by process P0, but it is not enough to fulfill the other requests. The deadlock exists consisting of the processes P1, 2, 3, and 4. So, when should we invoke the detection algorithm? This answer depends on two factors. How often is a deadlock likely to occur? And how many threads will be affected by the deadlock when it happens? If deadlocks occur frequently, then the detection algorithm should be invoked frequently. Resources allocated to deadlock threads will be idle until the deadlock can be broken. In addition, the number of threads involved in the deadlock cycle may grow. Deadlocks occur only when some thread makes a request that cannot be granted immediately. This request may be the final request that completes a chain of waiting threads. In the extreme, we can invoke the deadlock detection algorithm every time a request for an allocation cannot be granted immediately. In this case, we can identify not only the deadlock set of threads, but also the specific thread that caused the deadlock. If there are many different resource types, one request may create many cycles in a resource graph. Each cycle completed by the most recent request and caused by the identifiable thread. Of course, invoking the deadlock detection algorithm for every resource request will incur considerable overhead and computation time. A less expensive alternative is to simply invoke the algorithm at defined intervals. For example, maybe once per hour, or whenever the CPU utilization drops below some given percentage. If the deadlock algorithm is invoked at an arbitrary point in time, the resource graph may contain many cycles. In this case, we generally cannot tell which of the many deadlock threads caused the deadlock. When a detection algorithm determines that a deadlock state exists, several alternatives are available. One possibility is to inform the operator that a deadlock has occurred and let the operator deal with the deadlock manually. Another possibility is to let the system recover from the deadlock automatically. Now there are two options for breaking a deadlock. One is simply to abort one or more threads to break the circular weight. The other is to preempt some resources from one or more of the deadlocked threads. To eliminate deadlocks by aborting a process or a thread, we use one of the following methods. Now, in both of these methods, the system reclaims all resources allocated to the terminated process. First, we can abort all deadlocked processes. This method clearly will break a deadlock cycle, but at a great expense. The deadlock process may have computed for a long time, and the results of this partial computation must be discarded and probably will have to be recomputed later. Or, we can abort one process at a time, 
until the deadlock cycle is finally eliminated. This method incurs considerable overhead, since after each process is aborted, a deadlock detection algorithm must then be invoked to determine whether any processes are still deadlocked. Aborting a process may not be easy. If the process was in the midst of updating a file, terminating it may leave that file in an incorrect state. Similarly, if the process was in the midst of updating shared data while holding a mutex lock, the system must restore the status of the lock as being available, although no guarantees can be made regarding the integrity of the shared data. If the partial termination method is used, then we must determine which deadlock process or processes should be terminated. This determination is a policy decision similar to CPU scheduling decisions. The question is basically an economic one. We should abort those processes whose termination will incur the minimum cost. Unfortunately, the term minimum cost is not a precise one, and many factors may affect which process is chosen. These include what priority the process has, how long the process has computed and how much longer the process will need to compute before it completes, how many and what types of resources the processes have, how many more resources the process needs in order to complete, and how many processes will need to terminate. To eliminate deadlocks using resource preemption, we successively preempt some resource from processes and give these resources to another process until the deadlock cycle is broken. If preemption is required to deal with deadlocks, then there are three issues that need to be addressed. First, we have to select what's called a victim. Which resources and which processes are to be preempted? As in process termination, we must determine the order of preemption in order to minimize the cost. Cost factors may include such parameters as the number of resources a deadlock process is holding and the amount of time the process has thus far consumed. Rollback. If we preempt a resource from a process, what should be done with that process? Clearly, it cannot continue with its normal execution. It is missing some of its needed resources. We need to roll back the process to some safe state and restart it from that state. Since in general, it is difficult to determine what a safe state is, the simplest solution is a total rollback. This means we abort the process and then restart it. Although it is more effective to roll back the process only as far as necessary to break the deadlock, this method requires the system to keep more information about the state of all running processes. Finally, once again, we have to consider starvation. How do we ensure that starvation will not occur? That is, how can we guarantee that resources will not always be preempted from the same process? In a system where victim selection is based primarily on cost factors, it may happen that the same process is always picked. As a result, this process never completes its design task. A starvation situation in any practical system has to be addressed. Clearly, we must ensure that the process can be picked as a victim only a small, finite number of times. The most common solution to this is to include the number of rollbacks in the cost factor. In this chapter, we have explored deadlocks, a very common and also a very nasty synchronization issue. We then introduce algorithms both to prevent and detect deadlocks and also solutions to recover from the deadlocks. With all that being said, I'll see you next time.